Well, welcome everybody to Highland Heights. This is your first time. We, we are glad that you're with us. Um, Pastor Patrick, if this is not your first time, and uh, we are so grateful that you could join us this morning. We're excited about the, obviously, resurrection season coming up here on uh, April 9th on our website. Also, we, we have a lot of stuff we do. We have a drama on that Friday night for Good Friday. On the, the day before, we have a prayer walk where we really decorate the church, and it gives the steps of what uh, the Garden of Gethsemane. And so uh, it's serene music. Um, it's really neat the way we put it on. Nancy does a great job of it every year. The guys are going to help her put it together. And uh, that's on Thursday, all day from 11 a.m. till 8 p.m. So we encourage you to try to walk through that. Um, that'll be a couple days before Easter. So we got a little time, but it's all on the website. We have an Easter egg hunt we do for the community as an outreach. And, um, and then, of course, we have our sunrise service we do every year at 7 a.m., followed by our regular services. Oh, and sunrise service is accompanied with breakfast. Yeah, baby. I'm a granola bar guy on Sunday morning, so I like eating on Sundays. All right. We got a sermon here. Second Corinthians chapter 10. We're talking about defending our faith today. This is the topic of this particular spot of the letter of the church to Corinth, the second one that Paul wrote. You know, Christians or true followers of Christ are called believers. Okay? We live among those who don't believe, and they also are called unbelievers. The Bible puts it as those with God, those apart from God. That's literally the, the, how the word separates the two camps. True believers desire the unbelieving world to turn from their sin and believe. While unbelievers are mentally just fine in their unbelief, they want you to stay as far away from them as they can with your mumbo jumbo, and they could care less about what we follow right now. You and I belong to that same camp once, too. Generally, the world, the unbelievers, are tied up with the world and cannot rationalize what we follow. And we get that. They don't believe because at this moment, they don't want to. They don't believe because the, the, the truth in Christ has not been revealed to them. So what appears to be the real crux here, it seems to be that the true believers have got to try to convince the unrepentant to believe. But listen to me this morning. Our job, saints, is not to convince them to believe. The real task for the believer is to better understand what we believe in an effort to make an appeal to them at the properly given moment. This, my friends, is the real criteria for evangelism because you can't force anybody to hear what you've got to say. You yourself will never convince anyone to believe how you believe. This is solely the work of the Spirit of God. He is the one who moves them to listen. He's the one who moved you to listen to him. It, however, though, something here that we got to remember, it's through our words, our actions, our life, that the appeal is made to the unbeliever. Because the key is the planting seeds to show them that you are at peace in your faith. Planting seeds, sowing seeds, Ain't about money. Sowing seeds is about the gospel going forth. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Because that one who you follow is who can save them from this eternal damnation that they are otherwise going to be under, subject to. So how do we reconcile this? As a follower of Christ, you need to learn the scripture and you need to, to, to live as best as you can as a Christ, in the Christ-like life. You need to adopt a solid prayer life and you may uh, be able to continue to grow in your own faith walk, your sanctification. This transformation that occurs in you speaks volumes to those people around you. They need to hear that. They need to see it. They need to see what you're experiencing, how you're different from everybody else. God calls us to be a peculiar people. Why? Because we've got to be different. Well, we are different. We're set apart. The Israelites are set apart back in the Old Testament for the because they're the people of God. 
Believers today, Jew and Gentile alike, are set apart because we've got the indwelling Holy Spirit. We'll talk about that in a moment. Today, we have to learn how to understand making a reasonable defense of what we believe. What I just talked about is really the, it's, it's to preface the fact that we've got to be able to speak at any time about our faith. We might not have all the answers. We might not have some of the answers, but you've got to have an answer. Today, as we venture into the 10th chapter of the second, uh, second Corinthians, we will see how Paul makes an appeal defending our faith. Before we begin, let us approach his throne in grace humbly, please. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for bringing us together. We thank you for your mercy, your gentleness, your beauty. You're amazing. We pray, God, that you'd open our ears to hear your word this morning and write those words upon our hearts. Protect us as we go into the world and to do the best we can in defending our faith. Pray, Lord God, that I don't get in the way of the message going forward, that you would speak by way of the Holy Spirit through me to your precious children, all for the glory, Lord Jesus, of you. In your precious name we pray. Amen. We're called to worship this morning. I'm going to read from the book of 1 Peter, 1 Peter 3, 13 through 17. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ as Lord, the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, than uh, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Praise God for the reading of his word. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that's in you. That line right there is apologetics 101. And you may ask, huh? what is apologetics? Sounds like a fancy word. Probably one that you really like to avoid. Apologetics, however, is the most, one of the most important words for the Christian Faith walk. Apologetics means a reasoned argument in justification of something. That's what the root understanding of that word is. Christian apologetics means you're able to speak about your faith. If someone asks you why you're a Christian, oh, you're a Christian? Yeah, why? I was raised that way. Get out with that one. That is not an answer. Or why are you a Christian? Because it works for me. Nutrisystem works for some people. <laughs> Not me, because I've never tried it. Anyway, you, you got to have a reason for why you have a faith. So you've got to do so reasonably. This all stems from the root word apologia, which gives us the root word for apology. But apologetics doesn't mean that we're apologizing for our faith because apolog apologia means a reasonable defense. The real interpretation of apologetics for the Christian lends itself to, can you make a reasonable defense of your faith? Can you defend why you are a Christian? Just a question. The apostles did an amazing job of defending their faith. But they all saw Christ. They all had an experience with Jesus Christ. And all of them saw the resurrection except for Paul. But Paul was chased on the road to Damascus, we learned a couple weeks ago. This is where their dealings with Jesus gives them the strength and our audacity. They went from chumps not even wanting to, to say that they knew him and scampered like cockroaches when the light went on to all of them trusting so much in, in, the, in, the, in the Lord God because of the indwelling Holy Spirit and because they knew who they saw in resurrected form and living form and ascended, that they knew that they would take that to their death and every one of them died. Either an attempt on their life or most of them died a martyr's death. People don't die in that People die for religion all the time. But you, I guarantee you, you take 
A hundred people are going to die for their religious belief. And about 97 of them bolt last second. True story. You got 12 out of 12 died for what they believed in. And then 13th, Mr. Paul beheaded later on in his life. Several wrote their accounts, and all these accounts are in the New Testament. This is why we continue to eat their words over and over, because they never grow old. Their words are never tiring to the ears of the saints, because this is food for our soul. They're a strength for us when we are weak. They're the building blocks to construct a tower of righteousness within each one of us. And our defense of why we believe what we believe grows every single day if we follow this. But if you put this bad boy on a shelf and you don't eat of the righteous word of God, you're not going to be prepared when someone comes up and smacks you upside your head. The difference between the apostles and us is that we didn't get to see Jesus in person. But Jesus told Thomas, blessed are you who seen me and believe. Blessed is he who never sees and still believes. And that's us. And we were giving something, something amazing. <laughs> Jesus sent the helper upon his ascension into heaven he gave us his spirit so that something is actually someone and that someone is the third person of the triune god that we serve father son holy spirit it is the same spirit that is one with god the father god the son the same spirit who floated over the primordial waters at creation the same spirit of god that has been there before we were even thought of as a race as a as a as a universe, as a galaxy, as anything. The Holy Spirit was part of the Godhead and he indwells within the person who repents and believes. This is something, dare I say, that we don't appreciate enough as Christians. Just as, as I was teaching my apologetics class the other day, we, we find many within the church talking to God and maybe mentioning Jesus like he's a third person, like he's in the corner. And the Holy Spirit as an entity with no or little consideration. The true believers follow a triune God, one God, three distinct persons, all three people, all three persons, excuse me, not people, all three persons are three equally, all three co-eternal, co-equal. And the Spirit of God, who has always been, now enters into the believers and is, is, is who, who actually baptizes into us. That's the difference of baptism. Look at Acts 1.5. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Repent and be baptized. Listen to what Peter says. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, water baptism is wildly important because it signifies an outwardly change of what's going on in the inside of us. But that dipping in the water is not what he means. It means the Spirit of God takes up residence. That's what Jesus said in Acts 1.5. For John baptized with water. And it's important to show the outward change. But that ain't what saves you. Because there's going to be people who are water baptized in hell. Just like there's going to be people who cuss, smoked, and drink in heaven. Amen, somebody. Let's get this right. Let's find our, our, our understanding of the gospel from the gospel, not what we thought it meant. If it doesn't jive with the Bible, it ain't from the Bible. That's just a little word for you, you know, in a public service announcement. Now, modern baptism is very important. And we love having a baptistry built in here. And so it's got water when I fill it back up again. It was all getting nasty and cloudy, but I'll, I'll clean it. Pool season means that you can get chlorine free, uh, really cheap. So I said free. It's not like I'm going to walk into Walmart and steal it. But anyway, we got a water. We got a heater in there. Thing when it's, it's up and running. People want to be baptized. We want, we encourage baptism. But I understand it. Repent and be baptized. What this means. And all of us to say, all of us to say, because we want to make sure that we understand because of the Spirit of God is indwelling 
That now you are set apart, you are different, you are not who you once were. None of us are. And that new person, the new creature in Christ, is who they will see. And be, by they, I mean the unbelievers. The unbelieving world has got to see you and I in action. Not religious. They don't need us to be more religious. They got enough of that. Religion always has and always will be hanging around. Christianity, true Christianity, biblical Christianity is not pretty. Jesus says, if you are going to follow me, you will be persecuted. If you want to follow me, deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. And people turn around and walking away. Yes, I was thinking that was going to be a good idea. Paul, like the rest of apostles, understood something. The unbelieving world doesn't have anything but the world to rely on. Nothing but the world. They have science and philosophy. They have fallen, carnal, rationalized thinking. They have fallen nature as the, their fallen nature as the catalyst for their living. Paul knew this. And Paul uh, made a constant appeal to the followers of Christ to hold to Christ closely. To pick up a cross daily and, and follow him. He understood this. This is a daily thing. It's a daily grind. See, what has happened for the church is that we got saved and then we got cozy in our sofa. That's not real Christianity. You can't get comfy in your sofa. But I, I like it here in my sofa because nothing's going to happen. I don't have to talk to anybody. Not a bad idea sometimes. I don't have to do anything, but I'm going to stay right here in my little circle, my little bubble. If I had more bubble wrap, I would wrap myself in it. You know what I mean? That's what, the, that's what a lot of the church has done. And you got all these people who are propagating a false gospel just stepping out. Oh, we got this. You, real Christians, you just hang back. We got this for you. And everybody got a bad taste in their mouth. Not anymore. It's time for the real gospel to get preached. And it's time for the real true believers to, to armor up and head on up that gate. That's what a real Christian, a true believer must do. And we learn about our battle in a moment. We learn about our battle. Because you ain't arming up to take on people. Sometimes that sounds good, but put that one away. I'll show you why. Turn, if you will, with me, please, to 2 Corinthians 10. We're going to go 1 through 4 to begin. It will be on our screen at home and here. I, Paul, myself, entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I, I, who am humble when face to face with you, but bold towards you when I am away. I beg of you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walk, walking according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not on the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Amen. Praise God. Now, think about something he says at the end of verse 2. I count um, uh, with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. There's going to be people and the unbelievers in the world who think you are just religious as every other religious bigot out there. Okay, that argument is caused by certain reasons. And it's generally because there's people who claim to be Christians, aren't Christians, and because they don't have know any better, uh, they blame us for everything. And then there's Christians who understand that this charge is coming against the church, but because that's been on the shelf for the last 17, 18 years, and we don't know it, we can't argue on behalf of it. Apologetics 101 is have a reasonable defense of why you believe what you believe, but do so in gentleness. And do I need to start busting out Aretha Franklin in a second? 
I will if I had to. But let me tell you something. Gentleness and respect is to be calm and respectful. But you got to have a reasonable defense. And this is what Paul is getting at. He's like, sometimes who suspect us of, walk, of walking according to the flesh. For though we walk in flesh, because that's what we're made out of, we are not waging war to the flesh. That's what I'm talking about when I'm saying armor up and head out the gate. We're not taking on human flesh as a fight. We're going out there to spread the gospel, to sow the seeds, because our battle is not of flesh and blood, but against the principalities of darkness. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. You're the image bearer. You signed up for this. Don't care for that notion? Don't let the door hit you. Again, this goes back to the comfort couch thing, right? The sofa recliner. Oh, I just, I just like going to church because it makes me feel good. That's a good one. And do you shut your yapper the next six days? Because that's not what you're supposed to do. Amen. Come on, church. It's about spiritual warfare. It's not about your feelings. It's about your spiritual warfare. It's about the fact that when you die, you get to be with him forever. Armor up and battle against the principalities for Christ because guess what? He died for you. It's the least you could do for him. But it's the most you can do of your life. It's what we're asked to do. And it's tough because we feel like sometimes people attack our character and we're like, ah, here we go again. I had the weirdest last 48 hours. Weirdest 48 hours. I, my, I can remember off the top of my head. Um, in a short period of time. And, and, and one of those moments really, 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 really affected me um, in a very, very strange way. And so I couldn't sleep last night. So I get up, and I, 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 I woke up about three. It might have been four. I don't know. Why do we still change our clocks back? I don't know. They did that for World War I. Anyway, um, I don't know what time it was. I know I didn't sleep long. And I get up, and I'm, uh, I, I'm reading the Word, and I, I, I start reading through the message. And I'm like, why did I go through what I just went through? I'm not going to tell you any details. It's not important. But one of them was so weird that if I did tell you, your mouths would be agape. It's one of those, like agape. Right? And I don't understand why it happened, but I looked at it and I'm like, okay, well, I'm just going to work on the sermon. And I'm going along and <laughs> emerald, bam. It was right there. The main point of this was because I didn't see the main point of this. You have got to make a reasonable defense of your faith, presumably to anybody who asks you, right? However, let's start with you. Maybe you need to make a reasonable defense of your faith to yourself because the reason why you can't defend your faith is because you haven't bought into it. That's what he gave me at 4.30 this morning. That is what I wasn't seeing before. And that, my friends, is exactly why we've got to be image bearers and we've got to share the gospel. Remember that you are hated because Jesus, whom you love, was hated first. It's not about you and I, it's about him. Man, you will take it to heart when somebody attacks you, when somebody chastises you, gets onto you for being a Christian. You're gonna take it to heart. You're human. Key is to not let it define you. You can't. As hard as it is when your character is attacked, you cannot let it destroy you. Amen? Cannot let it destroy you. 2 Corinthians 10, 5 and 6. Here's what Paul says to do about it. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. And take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. He doesn't say, 
getting ready to get on to people. He says, punish every disobedience. Paul uses strong language. Some unbelievers hold the false religious systems while others have uh, uh, well thought out reasons why they do not believe the way you and I believe. And there are some who are quite confident in their unbelief, appealing to certain philosophical and scientific arguments or so they think. But the word of God destroys them all, always has, always will. This, my friends, is how we boast in confidence in Christ. And then he, guess what? Goes to the boasting. Check this out. 2 Corinthians 10, 7 through 12. Look at what is before your eyes. If anyone is confident that he is Christ, let him remind himself that just as he is Christ, so also are we. For even if I boast a little too much of our own authority, which the Lord gave for building you up and not for destroying you, I will not be ashamed. I do not want to appear to be frightening you with my letters. For they say his letters are weighty and strong, and I love this one, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech is of no account. Let such a person understand that what we say by letter when absent, we do when we are present. Not that we dare to classify uh, uh, or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves. But when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. That last line, they are without understanding. That is justification of your sin and your wicked ways. That is justification for every false teacher. That's justification for every false religion. That's justification why people don't want to believe because they don't think there's anything wrong with that because we don't want to tell people that they are full of sin. Because that might offend them. Perfect time to tell you B-O-O-H-O-O if that offends them. It is what it is. And that's the, but here's the thing is your opinion. You're like, well, yeah, but you don't want to be fire and brimstone with them. Okay, but if you give them the fire and brimstone, then you go, however, we have a savior who died for such said sin, raised from the dead on the third day to prove it, showed himself to almost 600 eyewitnesses before ascending into heaven 40 days later and sent the Holy Spirit to indwell in the believers to make the representation of him on earth. How could you not tell them about the glory of God? How could you not tell them about the love of God the Father who crushed his only son on the cross, amen? This brings us back around to apologetics. It really does. And I want you to understand that while the world continues to try to justify as to why we are foolish, the Christian knows that we are justified by faith alone in Christ alone. We are saved by grace alone, and this is based on Scripture alone, all for the glory of God alone. That is the magnificence of our Almighty God. It is all done for His purpose and His glory, not your glory. You're not that cool. He's amazing. But He saved you, He elected you, He chose you, which makes you pretty outstanding in God's eyes. But not so that you may boast. Let's finish with that. 13 through 18, but we will not boast beyond limits, but will boast only with regard to the area of influence God assigned to us to reach even to you. <sighs> I love God's word. Amen. What, what, for we are not overextending ourselves as though we did not reach, did not reach you. For we were the, the first to come all the way to you with the gospel of Christ. We did not boast beyond limit in the labors of others. But our hope is that as your faith increases, our area of influence among you may be greatly enlarged so that we may preach the gospel in lands beyond you without boasting of work already done in another's area of influence. Let the one who boasts boast in the Lord, for it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one who whom the Lord commends. You defend your faith to people with gentleness and respect, commendable. 
you let the fruit begin to grow in you, commendable. You know what I'm saying? You help out people who are less fortunate and don't tell everybody on social media, commendable. That's the work of the, save, of the Savior does in us. That is the work of the saving grace of God. That is the work of a person who is saved. This is the boasting I was referring to. to. We, we, we boast in Christ. He saved us. Brag about his mercy. Boast about his magnificent ways. He is more than good. He is great, and he saved you and I. I want to give you seven relatively short challenges against our faith. And I want to give you a couple things about each one of how you answer them. This is apologetics in action. Okay? Just random. Charge number one, Christians are hypocrites. You ever hear that one before? How do we respond to that? Well, a hypocrite is a chameleon, is an actor. is somebody who does something acting like they're somebody else. The reality is, Christ's harshest words, harshest words, were reserved for hypocrites. Sharpest, harp, har, hardest words that he ever said were towards people who were hypocritical. That's the truth. The reality is here too also that there's always been and always will be some hypocrites in the church. But Jesus didn't ask us to follow the hypocrites. He asked us to follow him. Well, because uh, one time Hitler said that he, he quoted a, a scripture that makes him a Christian. If you believe that, you are as moronic as the words that came out of that fool's mouth. Amen? It doesn't make him a Christian. It still makes him a mass murderer. But I got to have that conversation sometimes. Well, Hitler said he was Christian. It ain't about what you say. It's about your fruit. And if your fruit is nasty, that tree is nasty. Guess where I learned that? In that thing. <laughs> Only found that when I blew the dust off of it and started reading it again. Thanks a lot, David. <laughs> Number two, what about the atrocities Christians have committed? Okay, that, that's a legit one. And let them talk. Well, what atrocities are you talking about? Oh, I don't know, religious wars, my favorite one, the Crusades, <laughs> burning witches, the Inquisition, slavery, even the Holocaust. The issue about atrocities is it's simply an extension of the question of hypocrites. So-called believers who didn't practice true Christianity have perpetrated evil. That's always happened. We recognize a true believer, again, by the fruit of the Spirit. That's how you answer that. It goes back, it always goes back to so many times they lump us in with every other religious group. You know, you got Waco, Texas. That whole ordeal. Um, and David Koresh clearly didn't have any that was right. But that happens. They're like, another Christian church is, you know, I'm like, oh, it's a cult. It's a cult. So these are the atrocities of these things that happen. What focuses on, uh, what focusing on atrocities really is, is really a smokescreen to avoid the real issues. And that is Christianity has far more positive achieve, achievements than negative ones. We have been instrumental in the, in the formation and, the, and the, the countless hospitals and schools, colleges, orphanages, relief agencies. It is the work of the church. Who you think abolished slavery? Christians did that. At the forefront were the true believers going, this ain't right. You can't own people. What's wrong with you? That's what the true church did. People who claim Christianity, no, I want to own every, I, I got, no. We've got to be able to answer these questions. Number three, the Bible is filled with errors. This is my favorite one because the Bible is, is it cannot lie. God cannot lie. It's very trustworthy. And it's, it's, it's told to us that it's inerrant. It, it, that it isn't a theory about the Bible. It's the teaching of the Bible itself. What most people 
claim as heirs in the Bible aren't errors, but difficulties. People struggle with the word of God. And a lot of times they go, well, but the Bible was written by, four, by people. Men wrote the Bible. So there's that fortune cookie you bust open and then you flip it over and take the numbers to the lotto machine. So stop it. Amen. Yeah, it was written by man. They were the scribes. The Holy Spirit influenced them to write. And those people were 40 of them, 40 different authors, written over 1,500 years. Do you know how much changes in five years? We're talking 1,500 years. Over three continents, three different languages. And it doesn't, it doesn't do what to itself? Contradict. Y'all are listening. I'm proud of you. It does not contradict itself. But people will bring it up. I mean, they're usually, they're easy to just, these things have all been brought up before. You don't have to know how to answer them. Just understand that they're going to be there and be like, you know, I, it's not, it's not. Number four, it's narrow-minded to, to think Jesus is the only way to God. Jesus claimed to be one with the Father. And he claimed to be the only way to the Father in, in, in John 14, 6. And he claims, I am the one, the truth, in life. Nobody gets to the Father except through me. That is, a very, that is a very lofty claim. However, he proved it by showing that he wouldn't sin, and, and he never did. So he lived a sinless, perfect life, died on the cross, raised himself up for three days later after stating that he would, Appeared to almost 600 people before ascending into heaven. And every one of those, like I said earlier, those, those apostles, disciples, they died for who they believed in. Nobody does that. Not in that gross amount of numbers. His claims were correct. Meanwhile, we had a guy named Joseph Smith who goes out into the woods and comes back and goes, God gave me special revelation. Well, who'd you take with you? Nobody. You just have to trust me. I'm going to look in my hat, and I'll tell you what it says. And he's got 17 million active followers today. Think I'm kidding. That's the Church of Latter-day Saints. Number five, if God is so good, why is there evil? This is a good one. But God didn't create evil. He allowed it, different. Sin entered through the world through Adam's disobedience because Lucifer wanted to usurp God's authority in heaven, was removed, and then he, sin, he got Adam and Eve to sin. And, and evil, it wasn't like Adam was, was like shocked that Eve brought the fruit. He was standing right there with her. He knew what he was doing. Did God say that? Satan said to him, Asked him, did God say that? Pfft. Oh, I can be godlike? Oh, that sounds delicious. Yeah, except it plunged all of humanity into headlong sin forever. This is what happens when we think we know what to do. We don't know what to do. We didn't create evil. God didn't create, no, excuse me, God didn't create evil. We created evil because we fell into our own lusts. That's our problem. I'm almost done. Stay with me. Number six. I got two more. This one and this. Number seven. Number six. Why is there suffering? Many hold that pain is evidence that God's concern for, uh, against God's concern for man, uh, mankind. However, however, pain can be used for good and bad purposes. We all know what pain is. What is pain? Pain is something that reminds us that we're alive. Not all pain is bad. Pain is, is an essential mechanism for survival. Without pain, the body is, is stripped of vital protection against itself. If you have pain, then you know something's wrong. That's why you go to the doctor, because you had pain somewhere. Amen? Amen? This is what we have. So our problem is that we remember that pain is the reminder of our need for God. Have you ever been so sick, so sick that you're deprived of all the fluids in your body? You're down at that bottom and you feel horrible? You know that feeling, and sometimes you feel like you're like God. <laughs> this, where are you? This is terrible. You all have been there at some point. You don't want to remember it, but you can reflect on those moments. Think about what it would be like to never be in the presence of God. 
that moment reminded you and showed you how much you need him in your life. That's the worst you're ever going to have it. C.S. Lewis in The Problem of Pain once said this, God whispers to us in our pleasure, speaks to us in our conscience, but shouts to us in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Love it. Amen. And last one, number seven. If there's a hell, why would a loving God send people there? God hates evil. When one day evil will cease because he will be he will return to destroy evil and sin for good. <laughs> and the day that God deals with evil, he'll deal with it all. He doesn't send God does not send anybody to hell. We all deserve hell. <laughs> We deserve it. It is through a merciful, gracious, loving God that he sent his son to die for us. That whosoever would believe it in him shall never perish but have eternal life by repenting and believing in the Savior. That's our ticket out. If there's a hell, why would a living God, a loving God send people there? there? Ain't nobody going there that didn't want to. Consider today as we leave what it is that you can examine in your own life and how you can become better at defending your own faith. But ask yourself first the question, do I need to defend it against myself? Let's pray together this morning. Father, thank you for your scripture this morning. Thank you for giving us your word and for teaching us. We pray, Lord God, that you'd please guide our hearts today, Lord, as we leave this place. And we pray, Lord, that you would just uh, open the opportunities for us to have good conversations with people. Sometimes they're bad conversations, but, uh, you know, those happen. Um, but we know that the good conversations will take place too. But we want to pray for opportunity. Opportunity just to tell people that Christ died for, you, for them. And, and, and that's what we really want. But, you know, Lord, a lot of times we don't want to bring up the name of Jesus because it's offensive. Well, so be it. The Lord Jesus Christ's name is very offensive. There is no greater name above all, all in any name. You are great. You are the greatest. And you are our king. May we repent and believe in you. And if we have already are a believer, Lord God, may we re re be reminded this morning. Help our unbelief. Let us repent again to remind ourselves that repentance is a daily occurrence. We have to remember to repent, not for salvation, but for our sin stain for the last 24 hours. Let us help to remind, be reminded of that every day and read your word and spend time in prayer. It's in your precious name we pray these things. And all of God's children said, amen.